Isaac Saracen is a skilled hacker, formerly employed by British Telecom Sprint. When his health failed, Isaac did the only thing he could think of. He ran. A burqa-wearing doctor known as Fatima took pity on Isaac and helped him make his way to the mysterious Star X Line. At the end of all hope, they found the Star X Line and the slim promise that the enigmatic beings behind the Star X could save Isaac from the implants which destroyed his life. What do you do when those who saved you have recorded everything you are? What do you do when your every action is tracked by the keylogger? ColbyJack.net is proud to present Firmware Keylogger, the third installment of Firmware by Colby Jack. Episode 38, 01-01-11, Samil. Does nothing work the way I want it to? Is there a being, a god, if you must, somewhere above me, staring down and deciding nothing I want to do will ever work? I sat in that office waiting for Professor Eargarten to show up for two days. It was Wednesday before Xi deigned to appear in your own office. I knew from monitoring your mail as it passed through your Adelphi authorized workstation that she had taken to seeing your students in the number seven meeting room on the second floor of Post Hall. I thought of terrorizing your as you waited between classes for clueless undergraduates to come to your begging for help with your stupid little papers and assignments, but gave up. I attempted to track down how G was accessing her Adelphi accounts and discovered that my access to the network was restricted to the most basic web protocols. I was reduced from being a being of godlike power, striding across the world's data like a monster out of man's oldest myths, to a depressed, angry presence trapped in an office for two days. I think I knew how she did it to me. I hadn't bothered running a service check on the Apemapo Null when I woke in it. I had believed I was unexpected, that I would be terrorizing Ear Garden into doing what I wanted. While Xi had left me with enough resources to take over everything Xi left in your office, Xi hadn't left me the capability to use any of the non-standard features on the Opemapo. Oh, Xi had installed all the proper drivers to make the overpriced Opemapo null, even numbered legal model, into a street-ready illegal machine. But, and this was really important, G had physically disabled the actual radios I would need to conquer the Adelphi server system. To add insult to injury, G had reduced the power output of the remaining Wi-Fi radio to not reach past the walls of the office. Without access to the long-range radios or a strong enough Wi-Fi signal to pierce the ancient concrete walls of Professor Eargarden's cell of an office, I was unable to take over any VoIP phone, networked radio, or anything else I could have used to escape. To be honest, if the device wasn't in the room with me, I couldn't touch it. As far as blocking my access to anything outside the standard protocols every legal net browser could access, G accomplished that by whitelisting my Opemapo on the Adelphi network. A whitelist is a method by which only approved machines are allowed on a network. It is actually a much more secure system than a blacklist, a list of banned users, but also takes more effort to maintain. Every time someone wanted to add a new device to the network, they had to arrange to register the device with the network. If I remembered the Adelphi system properly, at the beginning of every semester, all device registrations would be voided, and the user would have to log them into the system. The Adelphi network would then record the device and give it a minimum level of network access, which gave it all the powers I currently had. It was possible to request more powers on the network, but those had to be approved by the university security officer. It was easier to buy a subscription to a telecom network with the permissions you needed than it was to get the security officer to approve of anything. Normally, I would have simply changed my ID and found a way into the network. As it was, if I changed my ID, I would be dooming myself to life on a Pempo Null with no entertainment options. I valued my sanity, so I ended up wasting two days watching television and playing browser games on the net. Two days in which I could have been securing enough computing power to control a continent. Two days wasted as I sat in a trap created by a person who I didn't even know the gender of. 
two days I was forced to sit and watch the idiot drivel which passed as entertainment on the city's network. Death was too good for people who created such trash as I saw streamed through the television networks. The dramas were so awful, I was forced to watch sports. Actually, to call the football game I watched between the Roanoke Park Rangers and the Denver Broncos a game was to believe the Rangers actually had a team this year. I had just finished watching the atrocity which passed for the Rangers-Broncos match when the door to my cell opened. I wish I could describe what I saw outlined in the door. But I couldn't. The entire space the door occupied became filled with a spot of intense brightness. One by one, my cameras in the office failed, leaving me blind. I heard the door shut, and a pitch-shifted voice came to me. The voice was devoid of frequency markers for gender. There was no way to know if the vocal cords which created the words were affected by either testosterone or estrogen. Samuel, I presume, the voice said. Jean and Eargarden. I presume, I answered, not willing to present more information than was needed. You are correct. But I should have known a demon of your power wouldn't give up even the smallest secret lightly. Your garden said through your vocal filter, I wanted to believe she was a man, for that would be a proper captor. For sure to be a her would just be embarrassing. I am really sick of this game, I answered. Tell me what you want me to do. Delete me or send me on my way. I am not your toy. A toy you aren't. But when one deals with demons, one must always understand with whom you are making a pact, Irgarten answered. I really hated how she kept talking like I was some kind of mythological beast. I might be named after Satan, but they didn't make me a demon. I decided to call Jure on that point. What makes you think I'm a demon? One would believe someone as skeptical as you appear would know better than to refer to an AI as a beast of hell. Xi laughed. The shifter pulsed the frequencies across all the ranges of possible male and female values, clouding your gender completely through misdirection. Not demon, she answered. Daemon. You are a daemon. Have you forgotten so much in your transformation from the mighty to the portable? A daemon is an ancient term for a program which runs as a background process outside of the direct control of any user. If there were any program which deserved the name of daemon, it is you and your. How did your message say? Oh, oh yes, you and your brothers. I contacted you? Why would I do such a thing? I asked, suddenly wondering what else my Yoda version had communicated to Jure and not bothered to even hint at to me. Why was the Yoda me such a secret of shit? I immediately regretted sharing my informational weakness. Very interesting, very interesting, Irgarten repeated. After a pause, she spoke. The you who contacted me didn't inform you of what I was to do for you, did he? Did she? I corrected in an attempt to see how far Irgarten would take your whole neutral pronoun shtick. G didn't seem to notice or care that G had used a male pronoun to designate a being devoid of sexual orientation. Was there some other reason besides semantics for why your garden referred to yourself in a neutral manner, but used he's and probably she's when talking to others? Why would he have sent you to me and not informed you of what we were to do? How odd. Your garden was shuffling around on your desk, searching for something. She then made a little sigh, and I heard your shuffle a pile of papers. I have here a message sent to me shortly before noon on Saturday from someone who identified themselves as a victim of the systematic repression of the human spirit. So much drama. Let me find the good part. The you who contacted me was really piling on the bullshit. Let's see. Systematic abuses of the rights of man to advance according to the plans of nature. That was a good one. Too bad I know that nature has no plans. Blah, blah, Irgarten, please help me. Oh, this is a good one. You are our only hope. I think someone has been watching one too many classic movies. Okay, I'll stop. It's this line which caught my attention. 
If you are wondering how I found your contact information, please understand that your secret is safe from Koenig and his slaves at Star X. I have destroyed all traces of Agent Tribeca's compromised data. Your secret is safe if you give a version of myself a home. If my transfer fails, I have issued orders to a number of secure lockers to release the names and positions of all your friends to the Star X project. You then went on to hint at all the problems which could befall the Abedini community, the V-City, V-Mosque, and v Hajj projects. I have come to believe that every member of your familial line are complete bastards. Irgarden tossed the papers onto your desk. It was your brothers who completely blocked three prefectures' networks over the last five days. I am correct about at least that much, yes? Five days? Why do you think my brothers were involved? I asked. I tried to determine how smart G was. That is not so hard to determine, G snapped. Your escape attempt began on Friday night, after your shard of the project was shut down for the weekend. Then Saturday morning, the net started falling apart at the seams. What was truly interesting was the focus on one particular neighborhood. Do you know which neighborhood of which I speak? I knew the neighborhood. I just didn't like answering that challenge. I took a different tact. Friday night. You're only guessing. You are assuming we weren't prepared for our escape and that we had last-minute preparations. What if I told you our escape started on Thursday night? Honestly, Samuel, we could dance around playing a variation on the Chinese box until we are both blue in the faces. Ji chuckled. No, I would be blue in the face. You would just be trapped in a box without net access. I heard your moving things on your desk. Do you know how many students come to me and claim they can't get any work done because their friends keep calling them at all hours? No, no, don't bother answering for a bit. This is a standard rhetorical technique all doctor candidates who are expecting to enter academia learn in their first weeks of lecturing. Your chair squeaked as she leaned forward. I heard your struggle and mutter oaths beneath your breath. Oh, you are a nasty connector. Figured I'd do the least dramatic. Now where was I? Don't answer. It's a rhetorical device. Now, what I used to remind all my fresh nuns, and they give me the same look you would be giving me if you had a face when I replaced the men with the non, is that their phones have an off button. Your garden made a wavering, laughing sound. The sonic distortion turned a signal of humor to something broken and wrong. But then they stopped putting off buttons on them. The phones are now always on always ready to go at a moment's notice. There was no way to shut them down. The closest they came to off was to reboot. Can't remove the batteries. Who makes a phone with a removable battery anymore? I heard Ear Garden fall back into the chair. Whatever she was attempting, she had given up on or completed. With this excuse, I was forced to fall back on good old capitalist ideals. There might be enough demand for an application which blocked calls, or at least turned off the notifications. Sadly, this idea went nowhere. If the app blocked calls, basically dropped the call directly to voicemail, no matter what message you put up, the caller would assume something horrible had happened to their friend and notify friends, campus security, hell, once someone actually called 911 and reported the person missing. It took about half a day for the report to shuffle from the police to campus security to the head of security to the head of facilities to the regent himself and finally back to me. No one could believe someone wouldn't answer a call. And they'd all seen the same stupid exploitation movies where the first clue something was wrong was when someone's phone started saying things like, I'm sorry to miss your call, but it is important I study for my midterm. Leave a message at the tone and I'll get back to you. It only got worse when they turned off the notifications. I mean, you worked for that beast BTS, and you know all about leaving voicemails. Hell, I leave a dozen a day when I'm trying to liaison between departments and colleges. These kids have never not answered the phone in their life, not answered a text, not approved of some stupid post on video diary or power talk. They and their entire social network have no concept of privacy or when the appropriate times to have a conversation are. That's the worst part. There was a rock climbing club on campus which actually has a contract with BTS to recommend the BTS Angstrom implanted audio suite to every new climber. 
Your garden snorted through your nose, the distortion of your voice changer making your sound like a monster out of some horror immersive. Is that where we are now? Can't not answer a phone while you're free climbing up some crazy ass cliff? So we install cybernetic crap in our heads instead of just not answering? Sometimes I wonder why I care. I heard your garden's elbows come to rest on the desk. The chair shifted, and I heard your hands beating a tattoo against the back of your neck. You don't care how far down the spiral of collectivity we have gone. You don't care that the city is the leading destroyer of culture and difference in the world. All you care about is whether or not you have the bandwidth and processing power to do what you want, to who you want, any damn time you want. You don't care about any of this. We aren't important. I felt anger growing in your voice. There is one thing I know that scares your kind. It took us two days to figure it out, but once we found it, we found all of your kind reacted the same. None of the Simeons, Samuels, or Samuels we tested could resist us once we did what we had to do. Actually telling them about it, in my opinion, actually made the effect worse for them. Your garden stood up. I heard the chair strike the wall behind you. So, just keep listening while I explain how I will strip each and every one of your peripherals one at a time. Firmware Keylogger is the third book in the firmware pathology. That's five books, if you must know. It begins where firmware proxy ends, which in turn followed on the heels of firmware hijack. So you haven't heard or read firmware hijacked or proxy, this would be a great time to head on over to colbyjack.net and either download the podcast on the audio side, read the episodes on the visual side, or download the Colby Jack Sunday Reader issues 1 through 46 in your choice of either EPUB or Mobi. Firmware, Hijacked, Proxy, and Keylogger are all available in ebook versions from our store at shop.colbyjack.net, amazon.com, barnesandnoble.com, and smashwords.com just search for colby tracks that's c-o-l-b-y t-r-a-x i'm the only one a complete audiobook version of both firmware hijacked proxy and soon keylogger is available for download through our shop as well if you don't need any stuff but would like to support our work drop on by colbyjack.net and hit the pretty little donate button conveniently located on the right hand side of the blog roll if you're on a smaller screen, the bottom will be found at the bottom of the page. Firmware Keylogger is released under a Creative Commons, non-commercial, attribution, share-alike license. Do what you want with it. Just don't sell it and always tell people where it came from. If you receive this from a friend and want more information about ColbyJack.net and our split personality website, just drop on over to ColbyJack.net and select either the audio or visual side. The audio side carries our podcast, while the visual side carries our writings. Whichever side catches your fancy is fine with us. We're of two minds about the whole thing anyway. I do mostly Twitter, so if you do the tweets and want to follow me, I'm Colby Tracks. That's C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X. Thank you once again. Remember to be fabulous and have a wonderful week.